Others who do not consider Plato's narration to be an invention persevere in trying to interpret it in a way which would make it possible to link it with the already explored archaeological sites. Thus, some of them contend that none other than the island of Crete is Plato's Atlantis, claiming also that Greeks used the name of the Pillars of Hercules mentioned by Plato, not for what is now called the Strait of Gibraltar, but for some rocks which were situated on the way from Athens to Crete. And I think that's where we ended it last week. So then, uh, because that's probably the most popular of the ideas now that if Plato had any literal idea in mind, or if there was a, a, a literal or actual um, history to Atlantis or the idea of Atlantis, it was really the destruction of Minoan Crete. The or century Terra. a variant on that, the destruction of the island of, of Terra by okay. the eruption of Santorini. Are they on the island of Santorini, the volcano Terra? Um, so then he goes on to say that given such an interpretation, it becomes imperative for them to bring the date of the vanishing Atlantis given by Plato in line with the time of the decline of the Minoan civilization established by archaeologists and link it to the explosion of Terra on Santorini. Hence is given rise, it rise is given to the hypothesis that the span of time between the vanishing of Atlantis and the conversation between Solon and the priest is actually 10 times shorter and that the mistake was made either when Egyptian priests were copying the sacred records or because Plato himself, like all his contemporaries, had little sense of time and dating. What? I don't know. I find that to be... A bit condescending. <laughs> yeah, a bit condescending and, and uh, very questionable yeah. assumption. Um, um, a bunch of savages don't know how to count time. Is basically what Yeah, saying. that savage Plato doesn't know how to count time, right? Yeah. Even though, he goes on to, this author goes on to say, and obviously lower sea level is taken, it can be seen that in the area of the present Azores and Canaries, which are most often pointed to as the remains of the sunken Atlantis, there had been no sizable land. Um, so what he's doing there is he's echoing the book Atlantis Fact or Fiction and, and the few other uh, articles and papers that came out purporting to, to say that there was no geological basis for any sunken landmass in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. So my point last week was that, and just like he's making here, if coming up to those late 60s and 70s in this shift when, when, when oceanography and marine geology really became a thing, this is when you saw this shift where previous to that, most of the um, stories, books, uh, and, and things about Atlantis put it in the mid-Atlantic, obviously and, and naturally because it's so clear that that's where Plato was pointing, right? Post, say, 1978, after Atlantis Fact or Fiction, that's when you see uh, the Atlantis researchers going all over the world, picking out this place or that place that in one detail or another does not conform to Plato's narrative. And so they have to make these assumptions that, well, no, he really meant this when he said that kind of thing. Whereas I say, no, let's just go back to the original account. <clears throat> but he, now here, here, here this, this Russian author does make an excellent point here. He says, and this was the word that was used in, in, in Plato's accounts, the word nasos, nasos, probably uh, 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 would be um, nun, uh, epsilon, sigma, omicron, sigma, as I'm guessing would be the spelling of it. I have the Greek back there on my shelf and I could look it up, but the point is. Any SOS or any yeah. SOS? Any SOS, yes, in the Greek. So in the original, it would have been nun. It would either have been an epsilon or an eta in the second place, sigma, omicron, sigma. The Greek word nes nesos or nesos used by Plato quite unambiguously is translated as island. And I have no reason whatsoever to assume that once upon a time it could have had another meaning as well. Um, in the same vein, the Latin word insula does not seem to allow other interpretations. So is it possible to equate that area of land in the west of Europe with Plato's Atlantis? I believe it is. And there are two ex possible explanations of why the word, which means island, is used for something that actually was not one. So here he is. He's admitting 
that Plato used the word for island. He's then putting Atlantis in Northwestern Europe. He comes <laughs> up with his explanation for why the word Nasos, which means island, which was used by Plato, was actually meant something else. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'm saying here, my point being, is we could go through all of these various accounts, right, that deviate in one, one detail or another, or multiple details from Plato's account. Now, the question I would ask is, how far can we deviate from it where we should even be thinking, why are we calling this Atlantis? Right. They're doing mental gymnastics to try to get some other place because this other book, the uh, fact or fiction, and this geologist basically said it's geologically impossible for it to be in the Atlantic. And they've, so everybody starts doing backflips and cartwheels trying to put it somewhere else, right? Exactly. Backflips yeah. and cartwheels. That's, and that's <laughs> what we've been seeing ever since the 70s, basically. But yeah. yet here, here, here is the opening uh, quote from Timaeus. Um, and this is Critias talking now because he's the one who's relating the tale to the, to the, to the Socratic forum there in Athens. Then listen, Socrates, to a strange tale, which is, however, certainly true. So right there, right, right at the outset, we're establishing this is a true story. As Solon, who was the wisest of the seven sages, declared, so he was a relative and a great friend of my grandfather, Dropidas, as he himself says in several of his poems, and Drobidus told Critias, my grandfather, that would have been Critias, Critias the elder, who then told it to his grandson, Critias the younger, who is now presenting the tale. So, so that's, the, that's the, 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 the sequence there from, from Solon to, to Dropidus, to Critias the elder, to Critias the younger. Now this is being told in the Socratic forum. That's where Plato hears it and writes it down. Right. And right. so for those people, those guy, all of those people ha are, were very, they had high standing. It's like, it's like citing scientists. Yes. Yes. In other words, like, so these days they can be like, well, those guys are just Greek philosophers or whatever. But back then they're like, no, these are the most respected. Yes. Some of the, yeah. Okay. I just want to get across that those guys were highly respected in their time. And that's why citing them is a big deal and saying this is a true story. Yes. Okay. So we go back to Solon in his sojourn in Egypt, where he heard the tale from Sanchez or Sanchez, the elderly priest, elderly Egyptian priest. And this is generally going to be around roughly 600 BC, right? So we can say, again, roughly 11,600 years from Solon's time to our, our own time. Um, he goes on to say that there were of old great and marvelous actions of the Athenians, which have passed into oblivion through time and the destruction of the human race. And one in particular, which was the greatest of them all, the recital of which will be a suitable testimony of our gratitude to you, and also a hymn of praise true and worthy of the goddess, which may be sung by us at the festival in her honor. So that was one of the things that they would have these festivals and they would they would recite these poems and these poems would be these epic tales that had been handed down see and again this is the egyptian priest speaking to solon that's uh yes this is the okay. egyptian priest speaking to solon right okay. um and and people might go well you know hearsay blah blah but see what people a lot of the people who don't understand about how knowledge was transmitted is it was an oral tradition yes and the way those oral traditions work is you learn rote. Right. You become a storyteller. You have to learn those stories perfectly because the idea is you don't change a single detail, right? Because if you change a detail here, somebody two or three or four hearing subsequent is going to change another detail. And then eventually, you know, what, what's the game we used to play when we were kids? Sure. You'd sit in a circle and you'd whisper in the ear, yeah. right? What do they call that? There, there's a name. Line, that's what I thought it was called. What was it? Telephone. Telephone, whatever. Yeah. Right, right, right. But the point here is that, you know, uh, you're only, you're transmitting from the priest, right? Now to Solon, that's one transition, to Dropidus, Critias the Elder, Critias the Younger. So you're looking at basically five transitions between presumably highly intelligent men who would have been able to remember the details and pass on pretty much exactly what they heard. Right. 
So already trained in this idea, yeah. In one of the quotes I read last week, they were speculating well that there was a that the story got you know all blown out of proportion in the telling from the priest to Plato. But I would say that that's highly, highly unlikely to have happened amongst that, you know, amongst that chain of, of individuals there from Dropidus to Socrates. <clears throat> um, so then Socrates says to Critias, well, very good. And what is this ancient famous action of which Critias spoke not, again, now here, not as mere legend, but as veritable action? Yeah, of the Athenian state, which Solon recounted. Then Critias replies, I will tell an old world story, which I heard from an aged man. For Critias was, as I said at that time, nearly 90 years of age. Now, the, the day was that day of the Apaturia, which is called the registration of youth, at which, according to custom, our parents give prizes for recitations. And the poems of several poets were recited by us boys, and many of us sang the poems of Solon, which were new at the time, see? So that was his introduction. Um, if Solon had only, like other poets, made poetry the business of his life and had completed the tale which he brought with him from Egypt, which he didn't do, and it, when, when people read Critias, you'll discover that when the decision is going to be made to destroy the world and the gods get together for their conference, you're like, okay, now what happens? Boom, the, the tale ends right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very frustrating, um, yeah, it's very frustrating. So then um, Socrates says, tell us the whole story and how and from whom Solon heard this veritable tradition. So once again, you know, veritable, meaning this true story. Yeah. See, so all throughout the narrative, it's emphasizing, no, this, this is veritable action. It actually, it actually happened. It's true, right? So you cannot, from the narrative itself, say, oh, well, no, it's just meant allegorically and not, you know, not literally, because, you know, the tale itself re reinforces the idea that it, it is literal. Um, so, yeah, so anyways, uh, so when Solon goes to Egypt, I'm going to jump ahead a little in the story to get to kind of the essence of the thing here. So thither came Solon, who was received by them, that is the Egyptian priesthood, with great honor. And he asked the priests who were most skillful in such matters about antiquity and made this discovery that neither he nor any other Hellene or or Greek, knew anything worth mentioning about the times of old. <laughs> on one occasion, when he was drawing them on to speak of antiquity, he began to tell about the most ancient things in our part of the world, about Phronius, who was called the first. So this was kind of the Greek Adam. And about Niobe, and, and get this, and after the deluge to tell of the lives of Deucalion and Pyra, and he traced the gene genealogy of their descendants and attempted to reckon how many years old were the events of which he was speaking and to give dates. Thereupon, one of the priests, who was of a very great age, said, O oh, Salon, Salon, you Hellenes are but children, and there is not an old man among you who is, a, who is in a Hellene. Salon, hearing this, said, what do you mean? I mean to say, the priest, old priest replied, that in mind you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age. And I will tell you the reason for this. There have been and will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. Which reminds me of the old English proverb that says fire and water have no mercy. Mm. That is true. And this is where it really 
begins to get interesting now. The old priest goes on to say, there is a story which even you have preserved that once upon a time, Phaeton, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, but because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burned up all that was upon the earth and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now, this has the form, it has the form of a myth, but really it signifies a declination of the bodies moving around the earth and a great conflagration of all things upon the earth recurring at long intervals of time. So he's laying it out right there, the declination of bodies basically orbiting in space around the earth. Yeah. So, I mean, he's, and, and by invoking the myth of Phaeton, the myth of Phaeton is clearly an extraterrestrial encounter. 